Thank you for joining us for today's Ipsos webinar, illustrating the role of research and insights whilst in the midst of a pandemic. What, throughout today's session, you will remain in listen-only mode. However, throughout the webinar, you may submit questions online using the Q&A feature located on the right side of your screen. Time permitting, we'll answer questions at the end of today's session. However, if time runs short, then your question will be answered by email. Today's webinar is also being recorded and will be posted to our website within about 48 hours. Now, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce today's featured speaker, Alex Garin, Chief Client and Performance Officer in the U.S. Alex, you have the floor. Ellen, thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar, which will focus on the role we as insights and research professionals can play in the COVID-19 times. Uh, I'm Alex Guerin. I'm a, a partner with, the, uh, with Ipsos. I've been in the company for over 14 years. Let me give you just my overall background pr pretty quickly. Uh, I've worked in Europe. I've worked in Asia and now in the U.S. I oversee our client teams in the U.S. focusing primarily on tech, telco, retail, and financial services clients here in the U.S. Um, and I've been working with our teams and with a lot of you, especially over the last six weeks, uh, to help our clients pivot into this new and sometimes awkward uh, a world that we now live in. Uh, I'm based in New York, uh, where I live with my wife and two children. We're all confined in our house, as I'm sure all of you are. And I hope, by the way, that all of you are okay, safe and sound with your family, and that you're making the most of these interesting and troubled times. Let's dive in, shall we? Um, I think we are all seeing the COVID-19 crisis be completely unprecedented. and probably on three key levels which directly impact our work. One is the speed at which we got struck, the speed of propagation of the virus, but also the, we the speed of propagation to the economy and to uh, the way people have had to pivot to their personal lives. Second, it's a crisis of a different nature than the ones we have probably seen in our lifetime. It's not only a crisis of demand, it's also a crisis of supply and availability. As we will see, this has some pretty strong ramifications into how you as providers of products and services are engaging with consumers right now. And three, and uh, I'll be pleased to show you some of the data we just recently collected, the depths, the profoundness of the behavior changing that we are witnessing right now is pretty new and something that we haven't seen pretty probably since the research industry exists and has been starting to collect data on this front. The world has changed radically in the last two months. Two months ago, there were no deaths in the U.S., no deaths in Canada. The overall toll in the world was below 3,000. As of yesterday, we've hit two milestones. One, the number of confirmed cases in the U.S. is now over a million. And the death toll is over 58,000. That's more people who died in America than American servicemen died in the Vietnam War, just to frame things and put things into perspective. All of that happened within two months. What we have also seen happen is throughout the country, throughout the world, in fact, uh, that COVID-19 is impacting a wide range of behaviors. Consumers, people, citizens are behaving differently, their attitudes are shifting, uh, their priorities, their motivations are shifting as well. Um, there are probably, you know, eight key themes I'd just like to highlight. Um, one, we are all forced to find ways to strive in our bubble. There's definitely more focus on well-being, um, intent to learn new things, more cooking at home, uh, more time cleaning the home as well. Um, home has become a workplace for those of us who are lucky enough to be able to work from home, that is. Um, that means new collaboration tools. That means homeschooling. Uh, and we now have this awkward, blurred life where work and personal life really mingle together, uh, and the boundaries are definitely blurred. More focus on personal health, um, telemedicine, um, finding ways to enhance our own immunity, 
That has implications also in how we shop. This idea of no-touch retail and payment is definitely taking off as well. Travel and life outdoors is pretty much restricted, at least for the time being, and that makes us pivot to uh, other types of virtual entertainment, virtual travel, virtual events, virtual performances. We've seen more and more examples of that over the last couple of weeks. Um, home is also now uh, a place to play. It's an entertainment hub. There's definitely a significant increase in screen time that we're witnessing uh, uh, across different population uh, demographics. Um, we need to find ways to recreate that social bonding and to connect meaningfully. Um, that means probably more increase in we time within households. It also means more virtual interactions with loved ones, family and friends through virtual tools. From a consumer standpoint, we are witnessing a revolution of choice, primarily driven by, of course, these changes in behaviors and needs, but also because of the crisis in supply, which are leading to restrictions, which in itself are leading to new trial opportunities across a range of categories. And probably, you know, for uh, the months and probably years to come, a new value equation as consumers need to control their spending as well. So as you can see, very deep and broad uh, behavior change, uh, which are in fact impacting a large proportion of Americans. This is some uh, nationally representative data that we collect on a weekly basis here at, um, at Ipsos. 85% um, in home except for necessities, 67% um, trying to take advantage of this new time at home, people avoiding shopping at physical stores, people revisiting their plans for gathering supplies, and also some new habits that are emerging, exploring new things, 46%. More than half cooking from scratch more and trying to eat healthier. What an interesting data point, and all of that in a matter of weeks. This is also leading to unprecedented level of trials. And here we're speaking about trials of new brands, new products, services, or features that consumers had never used before. While this chart may seem to have some low numbers in terms of percentage, keep in mind that when you extrapolate that to the American population, you're talking about millions, tens of millions of consumers who are trying new products, new services, and new features. This is the revolution of choice. This is the revolution of try. 8% um, um, trying new delivery services for groceries an additional 6% pre-ordering and pickup uh, uh, from, from stores. 11% trying new streaming services. Uh, we thought before the crisis that there would be a cap in the streaming wars as to the number of services that people could actually use. Um, that cap has definitely uh, been significantly increased over the last couple of, um, of weeks. Telemedicine, also, how interesting, 8%. And contactless payment with a smartphone, um, contactless payments have been kind of struggling to kick off in the U.S. for years now. 4%, that's millions of individuals who are now using this functionality, or at least who have tried it over the last couple of, of, of weeks. Um, we're also starting to see that some of these behaviors may stick post-COVID-19. Um, this is what people are declaring in terms of a future intent. I have new routines for grocery shopping, shopping that I hope to continue. I have new cooking routines that I hope to continue, 38% as well. New exercise routines, uh, new routines for grooming and personal care. So we are seeing that this intent for uh, a continued change in behaviors uh, is definitely there across a range of categories as well. Some categories and some brands may benefit beyond the crisis. Um, Select, when you look at the question of select the categories where you expect to continue using new brands, products, and services for features you have tried, 60% um, of respondents say that they will continue using these brands and services when it comes to home delivery of, gro uh, of groceries. And you're seeing very high numbers across all these categories as well, streaming, telemedicine, contactless payments, just to name a few of the ones that we're tracking on a weekly basis here at Ipsos. So, of course, what does that mean? Uh, it could mean it may be that it doesn't matter because we're going back to normal, that this crisis is only temporary. Let's dive into that for a while, looking at the data we have on hand right now. Um, majority of Americans in our polling are telling us 
that they expect pandemic conditions to last, that they're nervous to leave their home, even if and when businesses will reopen, and are unlikely to swiftly return to public spaces when restrictions are lifted. Um, let's dive into that data right now. Um, the majority of Americans expect pandi pandemic conditions to last. Um, you see this curve with 59% saying that it's going to last at least until July. What's interesting about this is that every time we poll, the curve moves to the right. So we are delaying, in fact, the return of, of, uh, of normalcy. At least that's how we think about it uh, in, our, um, in our analysis of the situation. Um, two and three tell us that they will be nervous to leave their home, even if businesses are allowed to reopen. And as you can see here, this is true across the world. This is not a U.S. specific number. It is true everywhere. Um, it's also true in China, which was significantly ahead of the curve uh, than the U.S. And lastly, three and four are unlikely to swiftly return to public spaces if restrictions are lifted. That means that the foundation of this crisis from a behavioral standpoint, which is more time at home, will likely to is likely to linger for weeks and months to come. It's also interesting to look at some of the past data. We at Ipsos have a, a, a specific survey on U.S. affluence. Uh, we've been surveying U.S. affluence for decades. This gives us a nice view into what happened in previous crises. Let's take a look at the 2008 Great Recession, and let's look at how anxiety among respondents evolved over uh, the years that followed the 2008 crisis. Uh, the year following the crisis, 75% of the of U.S. affluence were still very concerned about the economy. The year after, we still had 70%. Three years after, we were still at 65% two-thirds. So we know that this type of anxiety and consumer sentiment and behavior can persist for years. So what does that mean for us? How can research and insights help? When we speak to our clients, we see that there are three core questions on top of understanding and monitoring the situation, which we've just summarized in the previous charts. Three core questions that research and insights professionals need to address. The first one is, how do I virus-proof my products and services? There are some must-win battles, as we call them. Products and services need to be made available despite restrictions and access uh, and limited access. Um, portfolios need to be revised. Um, digital channels online, e-commerce, more important than ever now. Not all brands were ready to meet that surge in demand through from digital channels. So the performance of these channels is a critical business question. Virus proofing any face-to-face -face experiences um, and also competitive benchmarking. How are you performing versus competitors? The situation is changing so rapidly that any delay in uh, the reaction of brands can have severe business repercussions. The second is about how brands speak, how brands communicate, how brands engage with consumers. Uh, there's definitely a question of being cognizant of people's anxiety, of people's emotions, of people's feelings. Uh, empathy is definitely required right now, and communications need to strike the right tone, and they also need to show purpose in times like these. Uh, but we also know that emotions will change throughout the, the crisis. So the question for brands is, how do you pivot your brand strategy? How do you pivot your messaging? How are, can you be nimble uh, uh, to communicate effectively as the crisis unfolds? And three, and this is probably the biggest question, how can we identify which of these new behaviors will stick? Which are the ones? that will still be there in years from now. What does that mean in terms of new business opportunities? Let's dive into the first one. How do I virus proof product and services? The first core consideration, probably whatever industry you're in, is your digital channels uh, and e-commerce, which has never been more important. Research can and should help uh, brands uh, uh, beef up their digital strategy in times like this. E-commerce readiness, 
um, optimizing the journey to whatever digital asset or platform you are, are, are using, maximizing it lay, its, its layout, its, as we would call in our jargon, its user experience, making sure that the, your assortment uh, uh, is performing in this digital channel. Two, there's definitely a question of how do you reorganize your media mix and spend? How do you target consumers that are now in home? How do you push channels that will drive e-commerce or digital channel sales? Um, how do you evaluate pricing and promotional tactics through digital channels? Last but not least, the actual performance of your fulfillment of your last mile supply chain of, um, of fulfillment. Are your deliveries on time? Are your orders accurate? Are they speed enough? Uh, uh, BOPIS, which is buy online, purchase in store, pick up in store, sorry, uh, is definitely one of the behaviors that's, uh, that's picking up. Uh, uh, how is that performing? Uh, let's not forget that deliveries are, in fact, the physical touch points. Um, are the people managing uh, or delivering the products respecting all the health guidelines. How is that perceived by your consumer when they pick up a package in front of their doors? Uh, and last but not least, customer service, which is definitely seeing a surge in calls, in requests, in tickets. How are they performing? Uh, all of these are significant considerations, uh, must-win battles that research can help optimize and answer. If we move from digital to the brick and mortar world, um, we think that this is a great time for research teams to um, enhance their data integration and real-time analytics capabilities. Um, through data sources like COVID statistics, which you can get from mining social media or looking at how many people are entering hospitals, um, through geomobility data, which is basically tracking people on their phones, understanding if they're staying at home or if they're moving and where they're going to. Through analyzing sentiment on social media, um, local online news, which we can now tag at a very granular level, zip code, county, you can understand how people are feeling and how this on the bottom left is an anger index in New York State. You can see significant differences uh, uh, county by county. Uh, and then also you can also look at transaction data to understand basically where is the economy on hold, where is it picking up, how are people feeling about, um, about the future. These are wonderful tools to help understand how America is going to reopen and how they're going to adjust to new behaviors as well. This has implications for how brick and mortar outlets will reopen stores, how they will staff these stores, how they will manage their supply chain, uh, how they will geo-target their advertising and maximize their uh, promotional dollars and where and when they should be rolling out new offers. This is true for merchants and suppliers alike, by the way. When brick and mortar America reopens, uh, I think we can all intuitively say that uh, there will have to be new standards in terms of customer experience. Um, the word of customer may be confident is probably a better one than customer experience in a, in a time like this. How do we make shoppers feel confident about walking into a retail store? Uh, there will need to be touch points that will have to be completely resolved, completely redesigned to, in, to in, in, include new considerations around cautiousness, around the definition of touch, of proximity, of what a personal interaction will mean uh, in a world where COVID-19 is still lingering around us. Um, behavioral science, those of you who work with it know how important behavioral science is as a a foundation to our thinking and to the service we provide for, um, for, for clients, that there are ways to you know, nudge and signal safety to consumers as well. That has to be a consideration. And last but not least, there will have to be a constant and continuous effort to measure and monitor the impact of these measures on consumers and staff alike. So how can research help? You know, manage what will likely be a six feet apart economy for weeks and months to come. Um, well, occupancy check is, is, is one of, uh, of those tools. Um, data integration with footfall traffic, for instance, to understand how many people are coming in stores. Uh, are we keeping the right level of capacity? Um, are social distancing guidelines 
Uh, are they uh, well sought out? Are they visible? Are they being respected? Measure availability of hand sanitizers, wipes, signage, markers, etc., etc., etc. How is, is this perceived by customers? How is this perceived by staff? Key question and topic for any brick and mortar uh, organization to consider in the weeks and months to come. Let's move to the second topic. How do I ensure my brand engages consumers in the right tone? Um, how do we show purpose? in times like this? Well, first of all, and this may be counterintuitive, but all the research we do and conduct shows that consumers still want to hear from you. They still want to hear from your brands. Um, 83% I want to hear from helpful brands. 77% I am interested in hearing from brands that can help me navigate the crisis. Now, we did as we do each year for the Super Bowl, uh, kind of our little analysis of the COVID-19 brands out there. Um, uh, it was really interesting to see that many of those tests that we tested failed to meet airing standards on brand saliency and emotional connection. There's also probably a lot of uh, uh, similarities between brands out there in terms, of, uh, in terms of tone. So it's interesting and important to understand what best practices brands should be applying here when it comes to um, uh, be helpful and supportive from, uh, from advertisers. What we're seeing that works well is to be very action-oriented, uh, informative help, being part of the solution, showing honesty, the, the we're all in this together is working uh, uh, and resonating pretty well uh, when it comes to communications in times like this, speaking to social support as well. Giving back is something that is also uh, uh, very well received. Um, tone matters more than ever, and the tone has to be in sync with how people are feeling. Uh, right now, at this precise moment in time, consumers want to feel optimistic and safe from advertising. 37% favor security, 30% favor positivity. That is right now, but and this is where also research has a very important role to play in the weeks and months to come. We know that the emotions are going to change as we come out of this crisis. Whatever that journey is, this is a framework that we use here at, at Ipsos around the world. We've built this not only for the U.S., but also with countries that got hit by COVID-19 before us, China, Italy, France, and a few others. It's critical to understand the emotional journey. It's critical to understand at which step you are in that journey and anticipate what comes next and the role you have, brands have to play and the tone at which you need to be addressing your consumers. Social media listening, social media intelligence is a great tool to do that. As I showed you in an earlier chart, you can go very granular in terms of location analysis um, as well. It's a critical tool any brand needs to use, especially in times like this, and especially because that whole curve of going out of the crisis may not be so linear as we speak. Um, there is right now a probability, or if it's a plausible scenario, that as we reopen the economy, we will be faced with other outbreaks, as we are seeing right now in countries like China and uh, and Germany. So that path will not be linear, and the listening and the monitoring needs to be constant uh, in order for you to adjust your messaging and pivot your brand strategies. So uh, if we summarize some best practices that we've seen uh, in, our, in the work we do with, uh, with our clients, brands need to be active. Um, those of us who've already worked with us on these topics know that uh, our motto and tagline, creative is king, is still value. But if creative is king, context is its queen. Um, that understanding of uh, the emotional journey, that empathy needs to be baked in any communication strategy from, uh, from the get-go. Be prepared for fluidity. That's it. The situation will evolve. People's emotions will evolve over time. We don't know in which direction. And then we know it can move pretty quickly. Um, and last but not least, there's a significant opportunity for innovation as you can tap into uh, these new behaviors, which leads me to the third part of this uh, uh, presentation. How do we identify which new behaviors will stick? Um, probably now more than ever, we as researchers need to uh, uh, be 
maybe bolder, if I can use that term, or at least try to be a bit more predictive uh, and understand how we can help our brands and organizations pivot and benefit from uh, uh, these new behaviors in the future. Let me maybe focus on China for a few, uh, for a few seconds. Um, as you know, Ipsos is a global com company. We are present in, in 90 countries. We have a significant operation in, um, in China. We have learned a lot from what our Chinese colleagues have went through because they're basically two to three months ahead of this uh, in terms of COVID-19 impact. Uh, and some of you probably saw a specific webinar we did with our Chinese colleagues last week. Um, what's really interesting about China is that uh, definitely for businesses, it was a significant amount of change, but it also created a lot of opportunities. It created opportunities because China was in some ways equipped through a strong network of digital platforms, of a very efficient cashless payment network, and efficient delivery of products and services, which helped in some ways cushion the blow, if I may use that, uh, that expression. Um, but it was very clear that consumers in China are not driven by new needs, not just wants. Uh, behavioral modifications have been profound, um, and brands are coming up with new solutions to address those. Um, quick service adaptations can lead to new users, and that, if it goes on, uh, can be reinforced into what is actually repurchase and brand loyalty. Uh, and new behaviors can become habit. Let's take a look at some examples uh, of, in fact, products and services that came out uh, extremely rapidly as a result of COVID-19 in China. Uh, several beauty brands stretch very quickly into skin protective sanitizing products. Um, the explosion of high-tech stay-at-home beauty products has been significant uh, throughout the crisis. Uh, delivery technologies, driverless uh, delivery technologies ramped up extremely quickly. And there's also been a significant increase in, of usage in online medical services throughout the crisis. And that is still true today as we speak and as China reopens. Um, it's pretty clear that COVID-19 will change all of us. The key to, is to understand the human insight behind these changes, not just monitor the numbers, but to understand the deep motivations, insights, uh, needs, wants, cues that will link uh, and that will make these behaviors stick, actually. So how do we think about uh, current habits, new behaviors, and future stickiness uh, uh, here at, uh, at IMSO? So our thinking is heavily rooted, grounded in behavioral science uh, theory. Um, some of you know that we are partnering with Yale and MIT on topics like this. We have our own behavioral science team with multiple PhDs on staff. And we, when it comes to uh, uh, understanding new behavior stickiness, this is a type of framework that we like to, uh, to, to apply. Um, behaviors are cued. They are um, uh, grounded by barriers. Um, when the behavior is action, it triggers a, a reward. And over time, all of this can be reinforced. This may sound a bit theoretical, so let's take an example, uh, which in this case is uh, nail care. Uh, more people are doing nails at home. Will this last? That's one of the questions we should be uh, asking ourselves for our clients. So what will that process look like from the consumer point of view? There will be a cue, most likely a nail chipping off. That can trigger certain behaviors. These behaviors will be limited by place product availability. Um, is the nail stall or the nail bar open? Probably not. Uh, can I find the right products to do it my my, my, myself, uh, is the product available? Do I have enough knowledge to do it myself? Uh, is it worth the effort? Is it worth the cost? How do I feel about spending time to actually do that? All of these are questions that, in fact, are happening right now because all the nail salons and nail bars are closed. This, by the way, is an opportunity for brands to influence these behaviors. 
um, through digital learning, through availability, through a range of, of actions, brands can actually influence that behavior, which will then trigger a reward. Rewards can be functional, they can be emotional, um, showing my nails through friends, through on, on Zoom, it can be personal pride, and so on, and, and so on. And these types of patterns, in fact, when they happen and when they happen over a repeated amount of, of time, uh, which confinement, in fact, offers, uh, these can be reinforced. And these can then lead to actual other cues, which may not be just a nail checking off, but maybe I started to develop a habit of doing this while I was watching a certain TV show, or maybe that's just how I start my Friday night, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the pattern can goes on and on and on. So what can brands do to influence stickiness is the core question uh, uh, that brand managers need to answer. And what you need to identify these new potentially durable routines that are, no, uh, that are not yet ritualized. Uh, you need to figure out how you can drive internalization, like reinforcing that habit into a ritual, um, maybe by building benefit association, maybe by helping consumers build their own confidence in the mastery of this new skills. Uh, and also, if we go back to the reward angle, we're also seeing across the range of research we conduct that um, it's probably a good idea to create a sense of consensus behavior or shared experience. People are creating interactions right now, and brands that are seeming to facilitate personal connections have uh, some goodwill to get out of that, and it can help reinforce these behaviors as well. So one framework to think about all this, uh, if we go back now to uh, uh, maybe a, a broader definition of behavioral change, uh, which is rooted in, in behavioral science, but then which is maybe a more complete picture of how to analyze these things. We need to understand the socioeconomic trends. Uh, the, some of these are temporary because of the economic situation. Some will go back to normal, some won't. We need to understand behaviors. We need to understand motivations. They differ by, uh, by personality type and by segments. We need to understand also what can lead to cues. Let me take an example of that. In some of the data we shared earlier on, we saw that uh, people's eating habits in the US are changing significantly. Uh, people are eating and cooking more at home. And some will continue that behavior and others will return to usual. So we are seeing uh, a range and of data that proves that what's happening right now. You know, 51% trying to eat healthier, 46% exploring new things, 53% cooking from scratch core, people are no longer going to restaurants, people are not sure that they're going to return to restaurants right away, even when the restaurants reopen. So this is what the data tells us. So how do we think about um, will this stick? Is it an opportunity? Is it business that restaurants are bound to lose? Is this an opportunity for brands uh, 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 to develop more products or rituals around cooking at home? Let's take this example. It's sanitized data. It's an illustrative uh, example, but it's a combination of quant research, qual, and applied behavioral science. Um, the first thing we can do is out of the, all those people working from uh, cooking at, at home, how do, they mo how do their motivations differ? We, in this example, use the Sensidium framework. I think some of you are familiar with that framework to understand people's core mo motivation. 25% um, are cooking at home because of a willingness to, of a need to control, which we would here call security. Let's take a look at into that population. What has changed for them? Um, well, people are working at more at home to stay healthy, to limit interactions, to stay within our budget. Um, will these barriers evolve? And this is where you can look at socioeconomic trends, how needs will, will, will evolve, how behaviors will change. The color color coded system you see here shows um, if it's red, unlikely to continue post-COVID. If it's green, it's likely to continue post-COVID. And then you can look at 
um, will all of this stick? Uh, and it's important to try to answer that question from a behavioral science perspective. Um, yes, there are some new cues. Um, some are psychological boredom and anxiety. When we reopen, when we get back to our jobs, to a social life, that boredom will likely go away to some extent. So that's a cue that may not stick around. Um, social may stick. Uh, it's something engaging to do with kids. Um, that is probably a good motivation and a good cue. Uh, although, again, will we have the time to do that when we get back to our more normal lives? Um, some of the behavioral barriers uh, will be lifted. Uh, if you're cooking at home right now more than you were before, you're learning how to do it. Um, and you will still have that knowledge uh, once uh, the COVID-19 restrictions are, are lifted. Um, it will still take more effort than, uh, than to go to the restaurant or to carry out, etc., etc., etc. This is just an illustrative example, and we are getting a bit short on time, so I would like to take the last uh, minutes that we have available maybe to summarize what we are seeing in the U.S. right now in terms of behavior change, what that means for insights professionals and how research can, uh, can help. Um, it's pretty clear that research and insights has never been more important to organizations right now. There's a fundamental shift in people's attitudes, aspirations, and behavior. What's also happening because of all these restrictions and these new patterns that are emerging is that all the data we had before, however big it was, to make the analogy with big data and to trying to predict the, path, the, the future from the past, it's probably a bit less relevant because all of these barriers and restrictions weren't happening before the crisis. Um, so we need to relearn consumer choice. We need to relearn consumer behaviors. And the brands who will be the first to do that will definitely get a competitive edge uh, as we go out of the crisis. So a little checklist uh, of the things we, uh, we discussed on how research can help. One, virus proofing all physical touch points. Two, enhancing digital offers and uh, surge testing your digital channel performance. Try COVID-19 stages. Try to do it at a very granular level. Sentiment is different from state to state, from county to county, just because we're not at the same phase of the pandemic. Uh, four, monitor emotions and continuously reassess your communications. Five, investigate which behaviors may stick post-COVID-19 and find ways for your brand to reinforce the behaviors and to leverage them into new products and services that your, that your consumers need. This, I think, covers uh, today's webinar. We are uh, getting a bit short on time. Uh, I see we have some questions, which we will address in uh, email after this. Uh, if you have any questions, you can also write to me directly. Here's my email address. You can also find me on WhatsApp or, or Twitter or LinkedIn if you want. I'd be happy to take the time to answer any follow-up questions. On behalf of Ipsos, I'd like to thank you for your time, uh, and we'd be happy to help in any follow-up discussions that you would see fit. Thank you very much, everyone. Be safe and be well.